What does it mean to be all in? It means you're confident you're doing the right thing. You commit to it. For Dominion Energy, we're all in on helping the environment. We're all in on clean energy, all in on solar, all in on building the nation's largest offshore wind farm. We're even capturing the methane from local farms to create renewable natural gas. We're not doing it because it's the easy thing to do, but because it's the right thing to do. For your family and friends, your neighbors and your community, for the future, for our planet. Dominion Energy. Actions speak louder. and welcome to The Blank Podcast, the podcast where we delve into those difficult moments with some well-known guests. I'm Giles Paley Phillips, and I'm down by the river with my friend and comrade on this exciting mission, I was going to say. That's not really the right thing to say. That is, is in a way, yeah. Is it a mission? Kind of. We've got a mission to find blank moments. Yeah, OK, I suppose it is, yeah. So on this important mission, like MI6, to find blank moments, is Jim Daly. Wow, what an intro. And Giles, it's not just any river. This is the River Thames. It is the River Thames, and we're quite well way down the river, aren't we? Yeah, we're in Windsor. It's Windsor. a very nice part of the world. Yeah, we've just been interviewing Her Majesty. <laughs> Old Liz. <laughs> hey, dude. Yeah, see what her blank moments are. Yeah. We've led quite a few, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. I'd imagine, down the years. No, I, 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 I joke. We, but we, we are meeting someone with a title. We are, and, and a sporting royalty, I would say. Sport, yes, sporting royalty, and our first ever peerage. Is it peerage? Is that what it's called? Um, well, he's a knight. No, because that's a lord, isn't it? That's a lord. Period, so, yeah, not, I don't know, knight, is knight higher than lord? I think so, yeah. Yeah, well, I think... Definitely. Yeah. Is it? Because the lords obviously get to sit in that place. But that, the knights are like... That house. ...have swords and stuff. Yeah, they do, yeah. So... Um, are they, they must have other... Have they got actual powers that they can... can they strike know. People? We should have asked can him they that. smite people? <laughs> we should have asked him. I don't know. But anyway, it's, <laughs> <laughs> this week's guest is Sir Nick Faldo. Sir Nick Faldo. Yeah. The most highly decorated um, European player since World War One. We Nicely found out. done. Yeah, very true. Yeah. yeah, yeah. An absolute titan of the game of golf. Oh, incredible. Yeah, In I mean, more ways than one, really. Yeah. Over a 30-year um, career, just won pretty much everything yeah. there was to win in golf. And, yeah. Uh, Really lovely guy, lovely to meet, uh, meet up well, with us. Well, this is the thing, because he had a reputation for, in his career for being quite sort of insular mm. uh, and aloof with people. But actually, he was really nice with us really today. Lovely, but yeah. He does talk about that, in, that it was actually a bit, of a bit of a tactic, actually. Yeah, yeah. It was part of, well, yeah, I guess he had sort of like a... Well, it wasn't sportsmanship as much, but it was part of his sort of golfing persona that he yeah. was like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that was actually one of the points we wanted to talk to him about today, and it was very interesting. And he was open <laughs> about that and about lots of different things, really. So... Yeah. yeah, it was a good one. Another one, another sporting person for us. Yeah, it's great. And um, we should add that we were recording in a cafe. We were. Um, so yeah. there will be a bit of back down now. There was a lot of clattering of cups. And it was a bit. It was a bit noisy, but not yeah. too not too bad. But hopefully, you know, you won't mind that, will you? Well, maybe for the listeners, it'll be like they're sat in the cafe with us. Yeah, absolutely. On well, the, we'll do on the table next to us, eavesdropping. Yeah. On the conversation. Yeah, and this interesting conversation about golf. Right. Well, let's just get straight into it. This is Sir Nick Faldo on the Blank Podcast. Um, all right, can I go back to the question about the bicycle then? The what? The, the bicycle. question about the bicycle. So you used to turn up tournaments in bicycle. Well, it was a different time. No, 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 no. I was... Um, so actually it was a... I was a keen cyclist. Um, well, I tried every sport. So one stage cycling came along. I didn't know, but prior to that, no, I went... Obviously, when I went to... So I was born, in, born and raised in Wellington City. Um, and I went to Sir Frederick Osborne. And had a really good mate, Steve Ellis. So we met, obviously, when I started that school. And so we built bikes. We go to all the scrapyards and build bikes. You know, we find all the bits. Remember the old cow horn handlebars? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. like the chocolate type sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. And, we, well, we, yeah. yeah. and so we we did that. And, you know, and I 
funny, I moved the day before I started that school. I moved to the other side of town. I was born in a council house, and then Dad bought a house on the other side of town for 5,000 5, points. And then, um, yeah, middle of terrace. And then we went from end of terrace to middle of terrace, very posh. So, <laughs> and then, uh, so I was just inside the bus line. The bus line was like three miles, so I was just inside. So I, had to, I cycled to school, which is, which is fine, but uh, hard work in the winter, obviously. Anyway, so we, I used to ride through and pick him up, and we go to school. Anyway, so we built bikes, blah, 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 blah. And then, because then when I started golf, I actually kept it secret at school because you know, golf was deemed a, you know, that kind of sport. You didn't, didn't really mention it. So I, by the time I was 14, so I started when I was 14, yeah, and then, so I left school at 16. Yeah, and I didn't, I didn't even have a locker. When I joined the golf club, I didn't even, even have, I had to wait for a locker. That's right. So that's when I had to, I put a plank of wood, plank of wood down the front of one of these bikes with my cow horns and just strapped this little golf bag, you know, a little ditty pencil bag, really, to that. Yeah. And, I, and then I rode from that, so through all the houses, had a great route, I ended up with going through um, um, Sherrod's Woods. So I had a route through the woods, and then I'd come out by a road, by the golf club, so it all worked out. But in the winter, there was a wicked hill in the woods. So going, I had to get off my bike and walk up it and push it up. But, but coming back, I, you know, some days I'd have a go at this hill. You know, like, you couldn't break in the way. If you break in the way, and then sometimes if I completely messed it up, I had to decide how to crash. You know, you, yeah, you do. Yeah. You're going down, you lost control, and you're oh, sure. And then yeah. you wait for the nice bit of slippery mud, and literally would roll it, slide it over, and then kind of let it go, because you just slid down on your butt. A bit like the... <laughs> Motor GP guys yeah, do, yeah, yeah. you know. So mine was at slow mo, and it was so uh, that was my world, and I, and I did that probably. Must have, I reckon I did that for like six months before they then, I then got a locker, so I could leave my clubs now. So then I could go to to the ride to the golf club. I had a racing bike as well, but you know not not at a level now. I mean, I think my racing bike cost thirty quid, <laughs> so. <laughs> not, not whatever you pay now. Three grand's a cheap one, isn't it? Now, yeah, cheapest, yeah. cheap. Um, yeah, so that's how I started. So was that, was that that six months waiting for a locker? Was that like some sort of initiation or like proving no, yourself? Yeah, or? no, you wouldn't know what golf clubs are like back then, you know, because I'm playing every day. It was funny, and I, and I put my first three cards in for my handicap because they were all around you know, low 80s, so I should have got a handicap of like 12, because they said, well, we'll start with 24, because, you know, <laughs> you know and it's, it's, uh, but no, I mean, it wasn't me, because I was out there every day, and I wanted to, I wanted to improve fast, and uh, so I did, I, I mean, it didn't take long before, you, your whole career, that's, as an amateur, revolved around your handicap, because, yeah. because by the time I got to 1975, in that, early in that year, I think I was off three or four, and it, it was a great tournament at Lytham, the Lytham Trophy, and, I, and the handicap limit was three then. I couldn't get in the Lytham Trophy. And funny enough, I then won in, in July at Lytham. I won the English Amateur, and then by the end of the year, you know, on the old system, Sandy Lyle and, and I were the only two players in Great Britain who were plus one. We got to plus one yeah. on, the, on the old system. On the, yeah. We never have a clue how to describe the old system, let alone the new <laughs> it, system. The whole system confuses me. The, totally, the, yeah. totally, totally, totally. So, um, yeah, it, so I had a meteoric rise through that summer of 75. I basically won, well, I deem I won about six big events. I won the Berkshire Trophy, the English Amateur, the British Youth, and all sorts, lots of small ones as well. But, um, so that was my winning year as an amateur. Going back a little bit, it was watching golfers, though, that... Yeah, so yeah, so yeah, it, it really was. It really, it's a great circle now for me because, you know, I'm watching. So, as I said, we're, in, we're um, I got, I didn't get TV till I was eight, you know, back then. It was black and white. I got yeah. color TV when I was 12. So, I am watching, I assume, live that late night watching the Masters yeah. from the end. Little did I know it's a CBS production and obviously. I guess it came on the wire, under, coming underneath the channel then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, underneath the Atlantic, um, to the BBC. And so I've watched it, and I literally came down and said, hey, I want to I try golf. Uh, you know, this, that looks great. I said, look at that, you know, fairways and trees and guys in 
bright colours for it because it was, you know, I, I credit Jack Nicholas as the guy. Who, he didn't win, but I credit that, you know, watching him. And what was it uh, about him particularly then? Well, I, I don't know if it was. It, well, I guess I remember because he. I don't really want well, to sit here. It's fucking forty, nearly fifty years later. Yeah. Um, um, I don't know. It's about him, but he was the prominent one. Obviously, yeah. Jack was Jack, and so even yeah, though he sure, didn't yeah. win, he was right there. So it was, it was like, wow, I want to try that. And um, so that was so funny to literally go down to the golf club next morning, and we didn't know anything about it. And I said, right, like half a dozen lessons. But that's how they started. Chris Arnold was the assistant, and he said, "Yeah, we we'll get you started with six lessons." And um, and I said, "Right, I'm ready." He said, "No, your first one's tomorrow." It's <laughs> classy. So I come back, and then off I go. And you know, now here we are, as I said, nearly 50 years later. What he did for me was was great because he inst installed straight away the discipline of this game, yeah. Yeah. which kids do not have now, do they? They want instant gratification yeah, on this phone yeah. thing. If, we, if they haven't got, they've got attention span of 15 seconds, or maybe even less, isn't it? A lot of things they can calculate how long you watch something for. So, to learn golf when you start with the grip, yeah. and you know, one lesson all on the grip, then another lesson on posture, another lesson on alignment, then a bit of takeaway, and finally hit a golf ball in about the fourth lesson. So little did I know. I mean, that was he. That was great for him to install. And he had a kid who was taking it all in, soaking mm -hmm. it all up, and then so. So even at that young age, you were really focused on learning yeah. the craft. Yeah, I had a, you know, that was, that was my only child, so I guess I was looking for an individual sport, and then golf came along where, wow, this practice thing was, was great, really good, engrossed me. Um, so I went rummaging through the bushes, found 20 old golf balls, and my mum was a dressmaker, she made me a tiny little you know, practice ball bag, and... So I'd either be, and then my next door neighbour gave me two clubs. Remember the ones with the old plastic coat yeah, yeah, yeah. on them? He gave me a seven and eight time. And, um, and I used to either swing in the evenings outside um, at home, and then I would go over to this, the school playing field, not my school playing field, the one up the road from me, and then sneak out there in the evening. And it was funny, so I'd then stand on the, I assume, like a football pitch line, and then there was a long jump hit at the end of this line. And so I hit balls, didn't, went back years later, it was only about 70 yards or something. But I'm hitting golf balls, aiming at this long jump here, being so typical me. Probably aren't the it? only time in your career trying to, trying to hit it into the sand. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so I'm hitting it in there, and I was good at that. I'd be typical me, I'd be cheesed off if I missed. And sometimes I might get, I'd, I'm sure I got, it was getting like 16, 17, 18 out of 20. And this number, I went back years later. You know, that long jump pit is the size of a bed. <laughs> you know, it's only 12 yeah. foot by yeah. 50. And so I thought, wow. So look at that for targeting as we yeah, know. Yeah. So I was, I was already learning this thing about aiming at the target. And then, um, so fast forward, so as I said, then I, so I was very lucky. I fell in love with golf, that was it. Because I loved the practice. I thought, this is cool. Because every, as you know, every shot is different. It means every, every moment in golf is different. So. So and then I'm getting quite engrossed, and then by 15, and a year later, I actually made the decision. That was it. I want to be a pro golfer. So, um, which is pretty darn cool for a 15 year old. Yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, what was school like? What did you, were you academic? I loved school. No, I wasn't. You know, some people were widely read. I was thinly read. So, uh, <laughs> so stealing an Eddie is hard line. Yeah. Um, you know, I struggled at school in that. I was good, good with my, my hands and all that sort of thing. And then, yeah. and then once golf came along, that really got me interested. And it's quite funny because, um, and then I guess I'm daydreaming. It, my school report, Nicholas it seems to have lost attention. <laughs> Sees me gazing out the window. Yeah. Well, yeah, then, well, then once they brought some... When the algebraic, algebraic equations started, I thought, oh, I thought how the hell is this going to help my golf game? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then yeah. now we've got Bryson, I had great fun with Bryson to Chambeau, and you know, um, I, I punked him on uh, saying, I, you know, I, um, when I was at school, <laughs> I didn't tell it was me, I said, there's a kid at school, I said, once he started algebraic equations, he thought, sod that, I'm going to the practice ground, what should he do? And I said, well, and he gave me a lovely long answer. I said, well, that kid was me. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so what happened next? So, yeah, I left school at 16, which was another major decision from my parents, wasn't it? To, you know, just talk to the... Ian Connolly was our 
professional. And they were basically saying, well, he seems like he's got something. <laughs> and um, so they let me leave. And, and amazingly, my dad got four pounds a week child allowance for me okay. then. Yeah, yeah. And to go and get an assistance job, I would have got four pounds a week. So my dad, in a loving, caring way, he said, well, I might as well keep you there. <laughs> so um, so I, that's why I went to the practice ground and just hit golf balls and, and practice like a lunatic. Um, the next one, wonder, the wonderful thing we did, we, dad drove me up to Troon um, in our white VW Beetle and our camping kit in there, our tent and stuff, and we went up to Troon Open. And that was huge for me because I sat on the practice ground. That's the first time I watched... Uh, you know, the greats live. I've got Jack and Arnold and Gary and Lee and Miller and Weisskopf yeah. right there in front of me. And I, my goodness, I soaked that all up for the week, ran, came back to Wellingard, and that gave me really something to to work on. So I mimicked their goal swings. Yeah. So, um, yeah, my daily routine, as we said, was, was ride, ride to the golf course. I'd be there by 8.15. I'd be on the range by 8.30. I'd hit balls all morning till 12. And I'd stop and have my sandwiches. It's hilarious. I had the same sandwiches for two years. I had, I had cheese and pickle, or cheese, your brand and pickle, or cheese and salad cream. And that yeah. was it. I had a yogurt, I had a chunk of dates. Remember the dates crushed yeah, together yeah, in, a, yeah. in a date, and a, a club chocolate bar. That That's was my, the treat. Yeah. That, was my, <laughs> that was my lunch for two years, honestly. Just yeah. like, and I never skived because, you know, hey, I, I was loving it. Yeah. It wasn't like, oh, I can't be bothered. Um, so you were, you were a real student. Of well, I was, a student, I was a student, yeah, I was the old school student where you learn with your blooming hands, your eyes and mm. your hands and your body. I mean, yeah, it, it wasn't, it wasn't, yeah. yeah, it was really ex learn, it, listening. I listened, Ian Connolly would say something about these guys could hit this low wedge shot and I'd go about there and I'd have to try and how do I hit a low wedge shot and all this sort of thing and then tempo drills and I did all of, all those sort of things. The other, and the other thing I wanted to say was, was really, ended up being really fortunate was my little practice ground in the corner of the golf course was only about 150, 60 yards long. There's a pine tree there where I went back and revisited that to say that was my spot. Yeah. If I hadn't gone to that spot, none of, I wouldn't be sitting here. So, um, and so I had one, I had, uh, I had a green, a bunker and a flag, just one. And so little did I know, I hit every single goal shot. Oh, my goal was to get it over that bunker and stop it in front of the flag. Yeah. So now a sports psychologist comes along and goes, targeting, you know, that was to the ultimate. There was no distraction of, you know, we go to beautiful range, you've got yeah. 40 blooming targets and you hit them and you don't actually see where they're going. I hit every single shot with a purpose. Yeah. So that was what was probably, those sort of things were amazingly powerful for me. That's the discipline. So I learned that it's, so I beat the blooming discipline into the ground. Because you, know? you had a reputation in your career, didn't you, of being very focused and very disciplined, but yeah. clearly it started right from yeah, the very start. Yeah, but it was, it was, that was me, that was my golfing DNA. I mean, you know, later, you know, the, you know, the media will give you a title and all this sort of thing, because, you know, if I played a golf tournament, I, I went there to play a golf tournament. I wasn't there to be one of the lads and go off to the bar afterwards, and it's when they didn't like that, because they were, they were, the media were part of the lads you know it was, mm. it was really the dumb thing to yeah. you know mingle at the end of it and I thought no I'd, I'd go off and hit balls so you get that label and and what have you and if you if you win or doing well then you get another label <laughs> you, you know, yeah. be, you're beating people or or you're relentless or what have you so yeah you get I was I was given all sorts of titles so it sounds like so that they, when you're going to this big tournament you're almost having to play the game play the media game, play the game of being one of the lads, and you, you just weren't up for doing that. No, I wasn't, no, it wasn't, it wasn't really a game then, it was, you know, it was me, you know, I, a lot of it is, as you said, the knowledge you had then on how you played golf, and I had this great ability to focus, again, I taught myself that, yeah, you know, Ian, Ian said to me, these biathletes can, um, Ski, obviously the heart rate must be a 200 off the blooming charts, and then they, when they get to the shoot a gun, they've got to be able to drop it and go, oh, they can't be. So, uh, so I, you know, I'm, I'm like that kid who's like, well, I take that on board, so what do you do? So you go off and we go, how do I, 
how do I get a heart rate up? So you probably belt board as fast as you can. So I think, so then now how do I slow it down? How do I physically learn to, and I did. So I thought, well, it comes from tempo and breathing. And all I said, so, you know, it was all, that was really was self-taught. So um, why are the people, are the golfers not doing that then? Were they a bit more? No, I, the, no, I remember I'm a kid in the corner of a practice ground. Sure, oh, yeah, you know, the okay. champions of the world are, are doing that, but, but it was a huge divide between European golfers. It was British golf then. It was British golf and then European golf, and obviously America was America. And then if Americans came over, they only came over for the Open. The big ones, yeah. And of course, they, you were in awe of them because they were superstars already. You've got Jack and Arnold, they're multi-millionaires, and what the hell is that? And they fly a plane and this sort of thing. Even their haircuts, they used to look at their haircuts and go, can't get a decent haircut? <laughs> you know, they couldn't, we can't, couldn't, get, they couldn't even get serious, they couldn't even get a decent haircut. You go. So, you know, and they're wearing their clothes, you go, oh my God, he's wearing a cashmere sweater and all sorts of things, these clubs. The clubs clinked and made a different noise to mine and this sort of thing. You know, I had a sack of spanners compared to these guys. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, it was just, it was completely different, completely different that era. You know, and so, um, so it was just, I was part of that huge, no, well, I guess there was a few individuals. That's why that show, if you watch that show, um, you know, the, whatever they called us, the Fabers Five. So there was me doing my thing, Sevy doing his thing, Langer doing his thing, Woozy doing his thing. And, um, and Sandy La, we five were all doing our thing individually. You know, I think Langer left school at 15, Sevy 13, or Sky from the day one, I should think. <laughs> you know, you know, um, you know, Sevy started with a stick and a potato, and anyway, you know, so talk about um, could be completely different to how you know, you we. We grew into champions than the, the formula now. Yeah. Completely different. It almost sounds like um, movie scripts. The way you're talking about you and these guys coming. From yeah, the, it, well, it was when you see how we almost. how we started. Yeah. It was he was a it was a lorry driver as well. To a bit of time off, you know, I fitted carpets and things like that. Um, and you know, it, it, I guess it, it that's what builds that builds you, doesn't that builds your character? Maybe. I'd love to have it, had it a lot easier. I mean, I'd love to if I was gonna, you know, as I sit here now, wow, if if, if, if that Faldo kid had all that determination and commitment and I had the equipment now, who knows what might have happened, you know, just because I mean, you, you, were, you, don't, you don't, you don't know. I you mean, were I pretty successful, that, yeah, <laughs> well, well yeah, well, you, you wonder whether it's less or more, or, you know, it's like. I interviewed Gary Player once, and he said, just imagine if I'd been bigger. And I said, but Gary, that was your determination, the fact he would fight for yeah, seven, sure. yeah, yeah. or not, probably not. <laughs> he had to stretch himself to get to fight. And I said, that was your determination to beat everybody because they were all bigger than you. And he said, oh, you're probably right. I said, well, yeah, if you'd been the same, wouldn't have been, you wouldn't have been Gary Player. So, yeah, you don't know whether all of that, because the, the biggest, the hugest difference, that's what I, I harp on the media now, is that, we had, bottom line, we had to win to change our lives. So that was the real difference. So, so when I went out on tour, you know, um, my first season I won 2,000 pounds. I lost money, I, could have, I won 2,000 pounds. I finished 58th. My goal was to finish, finish in the top 60, because that was the exempt thing. So you didn't have to do those dreaded Monday qualifying. And then I, um, so I finished 58. I won just over a couple of grand, so I lost money because of expenses. Yeah. Uh, um, and gosh, and I went to I went to Nigeria in early and played in a couple of pro ams and actually won money and came back with cash and we'd never seen. It. I came back with like twelve hundred dollars in cash and finally put it on the kitchen, put it on the dining room table and pushed it. We all pushed it around because we never dad didn't have cash. Yeah. So they got 1,200 bucks worth of cash there right in front of us. Funny, eh? So, you know, even, you know, when I was, like I was the first one, so that's 1977. So in, oh, so 77 I made the Ryder Cup team. And that's a, so I, that was my mission. And I think I won about eight or 9,000 pounds and I made the Ryder Cup team. And you were only about 20. <laughs> and I was 20 then. Yeah, I was, wow. uh, then, uh, then I was the youngest. Yeah, I was the youngest. Yeah. And he had a fantastic Ryder Cup. You know, beat Jack on day two and beat Watson 
who was the Open champion on, on the third day, and so I won three. And, and what does that feel like when you're playing against obviously one of your heroes? Yeah, and it to was. To beat them. It yeah. was um, unbelievable. I, you know that Ryder Cup was amazing. It was the first time my stomach churned for 18 holes. I had a great, had a great partner with Peter Oosterhouse, you know, and so off we went day one, and we were three down after nine, and we won. We won our match, amazing. And these, and you know, we're just skinny kids. It's so funny when you see the pictures of us. We're skinny kids, and we and uh, we, we both were determined. So that was pretty cool. So we, yeah. we managed to get that win. It was funny. Then the next time we're playing against Jack and Ray Floyd. And so this is now my first time I've played against Jack. And I tell him I was just, he was not quite shaking in my boots, but I, boy, could I feel it. Because I, I had an old, I was quite long in those days. I had to hit this whatever sling. I had a, remember graphite was just invented yeah, yeah. by our dealer. I had, a, I had a graphite shaft, which was like a lump of licorice. You know, it would twist. And, and I could sling this thing out and I knocked it 20 yards past Jack on the fourth hole, and I could feel his eyes in the back of my <laughs> neck, because I'm standing up, and I thought, don't look down, don't look down, don't look down. <laughs> and they were wearing bright red sweaters that day, and you're like, and so, anyway, we beat them, so it was amazing. And then I'd play Watson, and you know, I was like that, because I guess I'd just come off being an amateur, well, this was only two years after oh. winning, I won the English amateur at Lytham, and, now I had, and then I'm back at Lytham two years, so I probably was so comfortable, I played so well as an amateur, I, you know, I hold every putt. They used to just piss everybody off. They used to say, yeah. might as well give him everything. Himself. <laughs> might as well give him it himself 15 feet. No point making him putt. I hold it, every, you know. And there was this, whatever, these fifth and sixth and seventh. Six and seven were par fives, and I felt like I eagled one of them every day, which amateurs didn't do in that time, sort of thing. I don't know. So, um, so amazing Ryder Cup. But you know, and then, as I said, then you learn to win. I still hadn't won a 72 whole tournament. I finally win in next year in 78, I win a Burtdale, our PGA, which is our biggest. And that was huge prize money then, 78, that was 10 grand. That was our biggest by miles. Wow. So because in 80, and our money must have stayed the same because in 1983, I won five tournaments and I was the first one to go over 100,000 in a year. So I was winning tournaments for 10 grand. I won three tournaments in a row and I got 32 grand. It was a 10 and 11 and 11, that's right. Three tournaments in a row for 32 grand, you kids. Listen to that today. <laughs> Last week they had a playoff, didn't they? And the winner got two million and there was six of them wow. in the playoff. And number second meant they got 400 and something thousand. So there was there was a one, over one and a half million dollars difference between first and second last week. Wow. So I was just about the tweet. In, 1990, <laughs> in 1992, I won five tournaments and probably just, well, I won a million pounds, so whatever yeah. the currency was then, exchange. So call it one and a half. So I won five tournaments to get one and a half, and that was the difference between bloody first and second, so. Because yeah. now you could, you could be a golfer now and be a millionaire without winning any tournaments throughout the year. Well, you, you, they are, they are. But then, you know, back to what I was saying, so originally it was a very long-winded way of saying <laughs> winning, we had to win to change our lives because of those numbers. Yeah. It was a long way of saying that, sorry. Um, <laughs> no, seriously, when you wanted, so what did you want first? Actually, we wanted a Merc, didn't we? We wanted to drive in a big Merc. And those were um, 18,000, I think, then. So, we, so you can see if you're winning, so if you, well, exactly, if you're winning at 10, so seriously, you've got to play great to buy the Merc. And then, of course, you then want a better house. So we, yeah. then you move into this area, came down into this area, and you bought your first house. You know, to get onto Wentworth Estate, I think then, I think that house was like 185,000 I bought. So again, look how many wins that, I mean, yeah. that's bigger than the season. That's, you yeah, know. Yeah. And so, and then what else do you want? And then sure enough, you want kids to go to the school. When you grow up, you want kids to go private, all that sort of thing. So there's your, your lifestyle bit, and the only way you could change things was to win, to win more money. It made a huge difference. If you finished outside the top five, the money was hundreds of pounds rather than suddenly thousands. Of, you know, from fifth up, it suddenly, you know, we got from 500 and started climbing up sort of thing. 
So you had to finish it. So that was our motivation. To change your life, you had to win. And, and I guess and you're what, seeing each other doing that as well, aren't you? You are. You yeah. see what Sevy's well, doing. Or what nice car, yeah. Well, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And as I said, driving around in. <laughs> and honestly, my goal was yes. I want to be a millionaire by the time I was 30. Well, I ended up winning the Plymouth Open when I was 30. So, yeah, I made it. I yeah. made it. But it seriously took now, as you know, these little kids coming with... That can't be a goal. I mean, if they're financially, they, they must be saying to themselves, well, I want to have a 50 million in the bank, they must be saying to themselves, by the time I've done X. Yeah. I mean, it's completely... So it, I wonder, I mean, I, I wonder whether that just taints the, the t determination a touch with some. some. Some will play purely for win. You know, I play for, we play to win. Trophies. Prize money, the only way to get big prize money. And where now you can just play, you can play for a nice check each week. You have the art of sneaking up at the weekend and picking up a couple hundred thousand here, there and everywhere. And you, and you actually, you know, you probably know back in your mind, I'm not good enough to win, but boy, am I good enough to make an amazing living. Yeah. Um, there was a point where you, I know, again, um, we talk about the media, were a bit harsh on your, on your career and that you were starting to not progress maybe as much as you were when you first started. You started, you, the, the, the whole El Foldo stuff where... Yeah, you well... Know, to, and, and, and at that point you, you started to have a think about the way you were playing. Is that, is that fair? Uh, well, possibly, yeah, the, whether the... Yeah, well, so I progressed, which is all meant to be part of progression, you know, the yeah. learning curve in sport. So I, I was going great in 83 at the Open. Mm. I was leading with nine to play and blew up and what have you. And then, and then you start getting the negativity of um, every time you play, if you fail, then you get, you know, the folders and the failure. Yeah. And it, it, F arrives with a lot of failures and all yeah. sorts of things. So... <laughs> Um, but then, you know, then personally, I, then that little voice said, you know, I haven't got it. I haven't got it to get to the next level. And that's when I went for the, the, the swing change, the, the, the rebuild, which, um, you know, in hindsight was pretty stupid because I started mid-season. I started in May of 80, um, May of 85. When I, I met David Ledbetter before that and we chatted a few times and I said, right, I'm ready. Chuck the book. I just missed a cut at Muirfield Village, Jack's tournament. And I, I said, all right. So, you know, it was pretty daft to work on a new goal swing mid-season, working on a new back swing with an old follow-through. It did not work. So I just went downhill faster than, you know, lead. And then, and that was, a, I called it the dark days because I was constantly practicing, working on something, how I kept it. I had, I had amazing, I guess my gift or whatever, amazing determination. You know, I've never, I never th threw the towel in. You know, I pride myself on like, I actually threw the towel in in two tournaments and ended up winning one of them, which is quite funny. <laughs> yeah. So I pride myself like I wouldn't give in and I kept going and I would practice like a lunatic and then go off and fail and come back and practice and fail and practice. I mean, it's that went on and on and on. And I had a couple of, I had to, I had to dig deep because I nearly lost my card in America. And I had to finish second in, uh, that was the end of 86. I had to go to Disney and had to finish second to keep my card. And guess what? I finished second. So it's <laughs> funny that, isn't it? And then, um, and then it finally clicked in spring of 87, which was big, well, it was tough because I was in Atlanta um, and Jill, my wife, had, had, then had uh, just flown in and they turned left and went to Augusta, everybody, the media and the player. And I turned right and went to Hattiesburg and played in a, one of their, whatever they called them then, their second tier tournaments. But I shot 467s and finished second and that's when it all clicked and my, my game had clicked and that was literally nearly two years later. So that was brutal. Um, how I went through that because I lost my, I lost nearly all my sponsors. Pringle, good old Pringle, I mean my famous sweaters, they stuck with me. But again, that was stupid. That was a twenty thousand, I think it was even eighteen thousand pound contract then. 
did a lot better when we took the Felder range to the world <laughs> and I got a pound for every sweater. I did an awful lot better. So, uh, so it's a uh, huge moment in your career, really. To that was amazing. Change that was, oh, the, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, in how massive I, risk. Yeah. Horrendous Take. risk. Yeah. I never believed, that, I always believed, and even though I could see kids in the other guys when it weren't kids, you know, we were, we were at the, be at the, the baggage carousel and I could see them rehearsing my moves. <laughs> and on the other side, of thinking he's lost the plot, you know. And sure, I would probably say if I saw a kid doing that, lost the plot, wasn't the way to do it. I mean, now I would say, yeah, if it's mid-season, you and you really want to run, you go to, a, you take your sports psychologist, you take your physical guy, you take your masseuse and what have you, and and uh, and you swing coach, and you go to a bloody tropical island and you sort it out, and you could be back in two months. Yeah. You really could. I mean, if you just went and blitzed it and changed your body and your mind. But I was doing it bit by bit, the old-fashioned way. I used to go to Florida to a place south of uh, Greenleaf, a place called South of Orlando. And I beat balls. Like, it used to be 1,500 balls a day. So I couldn't close my hands. Wow. Oh, I couldn't close my hands. And I, by 3 in the afternoon, I couldn't close them. I'd then go and have a swim. And then, I, and then typical me, I'd come back. Oh, do another half an hour before or more before the sun goes down and seriously I, so I guess that that's very much the old school way like Hogan said the answer's in the dirt I, I beat golf balls till I made it, make it, made it work and it, I guess by the end of it when you come out of that you are what well, the real bottom line is you then have that thing which you're striving for and that's self-belief so if I've had enough golf balls where a golf club felt like it was just an extension of my arm it's funny, you hit seven irons all day. It's a hilarious feeling because it just feels like it's just grown out of you. It's yeah, actually, yeah. you know, it. Um, so is that when you start? Is that when you? You must have had self belief before that, surely. Well, you do. You, well, you have confidence. You have confidence, self belief, but you've got to take it to that level where will it really work under pressure at, at the majors? You know, Sunday afternoon's our biggest test, and and if you can perform on a Sunday afternoon. Um, I love that line. I think it came from Bobby Jones. There's two types of golfers. There's ones who can play under pressure and there's ones who can't. And it's as simple yeah. as that. And almost in any sport, you go, you know, it's can you hang on to whatever you're doing longer than anybody else? That's the real bottom line. And, and then it finally clicked, obviously, at Muirfield. That was an amazing week. You know, I kind of sensed it was going to happen. And all, the, all those visualization skills. Because in the past, I never forget, like, the Open Champion would always be sitting on breakfast TV, having breakfast with the claret jug. And so I was visualizing that. That's going to be me. I'm going to be Monday. No point packing our bags. Yeah. And it's funny how we used to, even that US Open, that the next year that I lost in the playoff, it's funny, Sunday I said to you, yeah, don't bother packing the bags. I'm still going to be around. <laughs> Isn't that weird, you know? So, um, and, uh, so that was the early, eight, that was the end of the 80s, which, um, it was a great time because Seve was the best player in the world and Greg was around. Um, who else was uh, trying to beat? Nicky Price then. Uh, obviously Jack, all the Americans would come over and beat us up at the Opens. Well, maybe even then, well, that's when things started to change, that uh, European guys started to get closer to winning Opens. And that was and our what biggest What was that like, time. that time with the rivalries? Do you, did, obviously we talked a bit, touched on it a little bit earlier, not hanging out with each other particularly. Yeah, but we were taught, again, again, you picked up on things. See, my dad said to me, remember good old Eric Bristow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He told me, my dad said to me, did you know he doesn't stay, when he plays for England, he doesn't stay in the England hotel. So you're like, why? He says, because he said, he's quote, he said, the day they know everything about me is the day they will beat me. So he's like, okay, I'll take that one on board. <laughs> yeah. The day they know everything. And so I didn't, I didn't mess around much. It was so funny. Um, some places on Europe, in it, I never forget we were playing, I was playing snooker, not snooker, Paul, we were playing Paul, with, I was playing Paul with, Paul with Seve, um, with the guys around, and I, I jammed a couple of shots in, you know, like you do, a couple of balls in, and then I said, cool, if I was as lucky as this on the golf course, I'd win every week, I just, this line blurted out, you see, <laughs> and I thought, and they all looked at me, and I thought, 
I shoot, well, I better go and win then. <laughs> because I did. <laughs> so, you know, it was, it was weird. So I, we kept our cards close to our chest in that time. It was none of this best buddies thing. Um, having lunch together before you go and play, going to the Bahamas and taking a house of 10 of you and also, hey, they're all, they're all best mates. Hey, I'm not knocking that, but it's a, it's a different time. Yeah. Our era, we kept our cards close to our chest. We, you know, we had rivalries kind of on a, I think you were always posturing all the time on, on and off the golf course because we didn't know a lot about each other and the only way to beat each other was with your golf clubs and you, and you, you wanted to, didn't want to show any weaknesses in any way so I guess I took the attitude, well the less they know about me so it was kind of, a, then you have that aura or you know mystique about you that people don't know you so let their minds make a judgment or whatever. It's almost like you're sort of compromising friendship. For yeah, you the game. did. Yeah, you did. Yeah, which is a shame because yeah, I get these guys now. They are good mates. Hey, good good luck to them. Really. I'd love to have more of that. It was, it was sad because Sevi and I, after um, when we captained that Sevi trophy, he says, Nick, you know, you know, we battled hard for 25 years. He says, time for us to be friends. And I said, well, that is fantastic. Yeah, of course we can. And it was such a shame because. God, that was a that was a sad loss because uh, you know we could have gone off and done exhibitions. We'd have made a fortune. Sevi and I versus Greg and somebody, you know, yeah, 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 car. Yeah. Whatever that would have been a nice. We'd have been sponsored up to the eyeballs. That would have been. I would have thought that would have been a good one. So, uh, yeah. So you're, you're right. You didn't really get. To, you got to know guys well in practice rounds and that sort of thing, but you tended to uh, be on your own. I mean, Lee Trevino had room service every night of his life, he said, because he's just, you're on show in the day and you want to switch off. And uh, it was similar, even with friends. Even if I went to my friends and said, we well, find out who your real friends are, because sometimes you sit there and they'd be asking you questions, and I'd say, ah, this is like a press conference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I said, yeah, I, like, I like friends who didn't talk yeah, golf yeah. to me, and they knew me as me and messed around, and so that was equally as important. Especially yeah. as well because you're sorry, Charles, because you're on your own on the golf course, aren't Absolutely. you? Absolutely, you're on your own. You and your caddy. I mean, you spend a lot of time, and and you've got a. Again, you've got thousands of people around you. Everybody wants a little bit of you, what have you? And it's and it's just you need to get away. And so some people would then, as I said, would give you a title again, like, just because you want to rest, and you need to, yeah, you know, switch off, go to room service. People then give you a title, don't you? Mr. Room yeah. Service. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was going to say, what's it like when you win a tournament? And obviously, it's an individual sport, and you know, you know like with team sports, you've obviously got yeah. fellow yeah. people around. Yeah. I imagine actually, once you get back to that hotel room, you've got your, your jug on the side. Is what, it, is it, what does it, how does that feel? Is it a bit what, of a come down? Is it, you know, because yeah, you don't want to no, celebrate you, well, you, you, necessarily? No, you're right. A lot, of, a lot of those victories are, especially in golf, we don't quite have. It's, it's, just sense of relief to me. Mm. When I went to open, it was that was just sheer sense of relief. That's all I said to myself. I've finally done it. Finally yeah. won. That yeah. was just sheer relief. And you're right. Then you you go back and and really you you're the one with all the thoughts. I mean, your caddy's right there with you. Your family are on the outside of the ropes, going through the ringer and yeah. that sort of thing. But you're the one who's actually there, lived it, felt it, really felt it. Um, so you're right. It's um, it's a funny thing. It's a fun, it's just. And I was always grateful that you know I could keep doing it. It's like you know every time you win, you think, all right, that's good. I could still know how to finish off a golf tournament. That's that was very, uh, that was that was it. That's you worked your, like crazy to to have that physical and technical and mental strength to go and, go and play. We are all in on clean energy, on solar, wind, and natural gas from renewable resources like methane capture at local farms. Because we're all in for our planet, a cleaner future, your family, and we're all in for generations to come. Dominion Energy. Actions speak louder. I guess in golf, as with all individual sports, you have more blank moments, I guess, than team mm. sports. And you're on your own out there. There must be moments where you really wanted your family to jump over the ropes, or you got your caddy, I guess. But it, it must be very difficult in those moments where it's not you missed a putt or whatever. It's well, not going yeah, right. Well, yeah, you can look. Yeah, we didn't quite. 
It's not even like tennis where you turn and look at your coach. Yeah, right? exactly. you know, why, what did, why did I miss that? But you, you, it's so much you. It's so much. You have to deal with everything yourself in golf. It's very, we don't, we don't have outside apart from your caddy. That's your only outside uh, influence allowed. So yeah, you've got to deal with all those emotions, which are an awful lot in golf, as you, as you imagine. It's uh, you go from super confident to believing you lost it in two shots. It's ridiculous. Yeah. You know. Do you have any techniques then when you're out there, any mindfulness or anything like that, that when you were in the moment and it wasn't happening, did you have any tricks that you did or anything? Well, I, um, well, I had that, call it being engrossed, the ability to be engrossed in what you're doing, I said, and you have to sort things out and you know how you're feeling. Yeah. I mean, my famous one was, you know, I'm making a mess of the open in 92 on that final day and I kept going to Fanny I said I'm all right I feel all right but what am I doing so am I hitting the shots in the wrong place and three putting kept saying I'm all right so I've been honest to her so she knew that wasn't you know choking yeah and um that one was the best one because I just said okay forget everything the whole week doesn't exist just forget everything I'm starting now I've got to play four holes the best in my life and I literally did I mean, three iron shots that I deem the best three of my life. So um, that was what a, the only the good example I could give. You know, when we played, if you played match play and lost a whole couple of holes, I think that's what you do. You learn to tricks so of either stick it in the bin. Yeah. I and mean, if I had a lousy hole, I used to pretend that by the time I walked to the next tee, it was two weeks had gone by because you can't remember that. Yeah. So if you did take an eight two weeks ago, does it hurt you now? I said no, you just Oh, you idiot. There's no, there's no more memory than that. So things like that, or I guess that was one of my tricks, how to kind of get rid of the negatives, because golf's 90% negatives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are there ever any moments where you're thinking back to hitting 1,200 balls? Yeah, and, there, was know, like, you know. time, there was plenty of times of that, because you know, sometimes you can trick your mind for good reasons or for whatever reason, you could be like, you could be playing really boring golf course, you know, really, and, I've, and you look at the hole and it's and so you'd actually trick your mind that you're somewhere else. You're over on a really pretty driving range or somewhere. We remember, and you can, I could, I had that ability to put a different picture out there, um, change the picture. So um, yeah, there was plenty, of, plenty of times when you had to. Well, that's the trust thing to literally yeah. go. Okay, I've done this before. I've done this more than once, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess you get your fresh back and standing there hitting. You know what you're trying to feel, and you know what it's going to feel like. So yeah, you, that's that's going into the memory banks. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I guess cad caddies must be so important then, because they're, the, they're the only person. Yeah, you've got to be like well, the most important. You've got to, to communicate well, and they got to. And they, I guess, the most important thing is when you get when the pressure gets on, they mustn't. Well, they're going to feel it, but they but they've got to disguise it, or, or yeah. because you can't have them getting twitched up as it's, well. Yeah, very they've important because there's a because they're under a lot of pressure. Because when you suddenly come charging down, right up to the ball, and boom, you've got a key shot, and it's you know 185 plus 19 minus the downhill, maybe a bit of altitude, and then and you can't land there. One, yeah, one yeah. minority of four. Landing it, got one of that, and you got to do it. So. Um, you want somebody who's pretty clear and decisive and doesn't, and again, doesn't say too much or too little because you could sense it. You know, when you're caddy, when you're working well with your caddy, you do feel they, what's the right? Well, you feel the vibe that it's right. When I say it's a six and I say love it, yeah. right? And, you, and you, that feels good. And then sometimes when they don't like it, and you say six iron, and they go, mm, love it, and you go, well, put it up. Yeah. So what do you mean? You, so then you can then you yeah. can sense that they they don't love it, and it's, that's why it's tough to get a partnership to go on that long, you know. Because um, so I played obviously played great, and when that would happen with with famous Fanny Sooner, so you know yeah. she was fantastic, and, and when I listened to and I listened to tapes now, because she'd always say uh, that's perfect. And then drag the bag away. It's all a great film image. That's perfect. Yeah. Work. So, um, and I always used to say, right. My word was right. And I would keep saying, right. right. <laughs> so it's right. So I did a lot of like 
you know, right, what, what do I want? What's a great word? If you say, what do you want? You hope you, a picture should pop up. Yeah. Now, what do I want? Well, I want it, this thing there, and I'm going to do it, and then yardage, and all that happens like that. And then you stand up, and, and then you've got to have bottle and commitment to be able to stand up and do it. So that's the, that's the formula. Um, Were you one of the first ever female caddy? Well, not the first to have one, but first to make one successful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a couple of... Uh, Fanny came over with a, a f friend, um, I think her name was Vivian, uh, and in the mid-80s, and they toured around Europe looking for a job, and then I, and then I saw her at end of the 80s and offered her the job to start the 90s with me. And... Um, so talk about getting thrown in the deep end because within yeah. a couple of months we were at Augusta. Yeah. Yeah, at Augusta. And she was like the first female caddy to bowl in there. And they didn't even have doors on the johns. You know? <laughs> even the caddy shack, didn't, yeah. and they walk in and they got all these loos yeah. open to, And so that to change a few things for her on that. And, uh, and then of course the, the giant boiler suit, the white, famous white yeah, boiler suit, yeah. she puts her belt around it and rolls it up and they didn't like that. <laughs> and it's bloody hot inside there when it's 85 yeah, degrees yeah, Augusta, yeah, yeah. you know. So she ends up in a, you know, so she's her own style. <laughs> so it's just pretty cool. But yeah, she, uh, she paved the way. But yeah. what was it about her that... that no, it was funny. It, 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 the funny thing was I, I didn't... I just... Um, professional, I was looking for somebody... I like the way she, you know, you can tell by the way they work and what have you, and and um, and to your teetotaler, because you know you get you get the old caddy who's arrived, <laughs> yeah, which has happened, yeah. and they they had one too many and they got the wrong yardage book. What during tournaments? Yeah, really. <laughs> it, was a, it was a good old days of caddies. <laughs> yeah. The good old the, the caddies were staying in hotels for. Two pounds a there's night, a lot you of, know. I was thinking there's a lot of there's uh, a lot of pockets there's on the yeah, pants. yeah. So they get so anyway. Um, no, she was just a good bubbly character, very enthusiastic. Uh, you know, we had to do things the old-fashioned way. The yardage books were hand-drawn and that sort of thing. So she was very professional, committed, and and uh, yeah, I threw in the deep end. Within yeah. a couple of months, we win the the Masters and then we're storming on and the Open, that was some first year. So I honestly, honestly, honestly never thought about it. You know, it was like, no. hey, it's a new new partner, yeah. off we go. And the, and the you know, the wave behind it was was amazing. But we got on, I'm playing great. So yeah, you don't think about it. When it's yeah. working, you don't think about anything. It's, it was great. So this might sound like a weird question, but uh, we were going back through old interviews and I was listening to the Gary Lineker one. And I asked Gary Lineker, when did you feel like you were really good yeah. at scoring goals? Yeah. And he said, he said, 27, when I scored four goals in the Classico really? between Barcelona and yeah. Real Madrid. Yeah. Did you have a moment where you thought, oh, I'm really, I'm really good at I'm this? I'm really good at this now. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I think I'm very proud that the, I went to the, the Masters in 1990 with the intention to defend. So I got Fanny brand new on the golf bag and obviously made that happen and then so, so then I was going then I was going to majors with the intention of winning um, so the next one was the US Open I hit the hole to tie so missed out there by a shot then I go to St Andrews really on a mission um, and it's so when you can go to an open or major with the intention to win it and you do I think then you can say yeah. like, then you can say yeah I'm really good yeah, yeah I'm you know I'm, I've got this you St Andrews was pretty cool because you know I went there and looked at the course I thought I can shoot 67 around here that's my par and that's why I reacted so funny on that chip shot on day one that Thursday I came to the last and I looked at that leaderboard and I was three under and I saw guys already and I then chipped in which made me put me on my 67 so because that is that is a very unusual reaction on a Thursday you know, always give me this. <laughs> yeah yeah you know, and you don't see that because most guys reaction will you know climb up as the week goes on so that was like me putting myself on schedule yeah and so um yeah so you were kind of playing against yourself and what, you know, totally yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. oh no you see you, you, you are you are all the time yeah. in golf you you set your own goals 
And that's you enough. kind of need to ignore the leaderboard to a certain extent because you're just. Oh yeah, you're right. Well, yes and no. Yes and no. You have to learn to react to it because if you're tootling along at one hundred, you suddenly see guys are already six okay, guys yeah, already at yeah. eight hundred. You're like, oh, I'm not in this tournament. Yeah, you've, yeah. you've ever got to have the ability to step it on, make it happen, or you just keep doing your thing. Hey, everybody, it's, that's the formula that does change, but they, you know, there's. Plenty of different bottles of that form. Yeah. Put it that way. There's different ways of making a score, whether it's shot by shot, as people would say, or have a, or have your vision at the 18th, yeah. signing for 65. Hey, whatever, whatever you fancy. I like the idea of visual, you, you tend to keep coming back to visualization quite a lot. It's huge. It's huge. I, I'm, I've been very fortunate because you you dream, I see things and I picture them, and you you get the emotional feeling what you're trying to do. Yeah, and it is. Blimmin' unbelievable what you can do. I mean, it really is. I mean, I can, the good thing is, 30 years later, I can tell you at St Andrews, my intention was to win by five. I said, I can win by five. So if I said that that week, I'd have, you know, imagine what they'd say. But it um, was my intention. So when you're leading by three and it's all going nicely, he said, no, keep pushing yourself. I said five. And you kept pushing yourself, isn't it amazing? And it's those margins, isn't it? He's even more, he's even wackier, even wackier. I mean, I've had a few of them. But the last one at Sonata, uh, Masters against Greg, I had that weird feeling that I, and I pictured it. I said, I'm going to turn and face the golf course, not looking at anybody. And I said, I'm going to win by four. So how come I'm six back? And that, so I probably she wasn't thinking I'm winning by four when I'm six back. Mm. But isn't that amazing? I had that feeling or that sense in, early in the week somewhere, and I thought, God. I, but I knew, I honestly, as I sit here, could see myself turning, and I said, I'm just going to look out over the golf course and literally say, thank you very much. That's the chip in my arms. Yeah, that's how I used to win. And I, funny how it used to go like that. <laughs> yeah. And so, and the funny bit was. Natalie, when she was tiny, when she was like two, so she'd show me your putting stroke, your golf swing stroke, she'd make a swing and then go. <laughs> <laughs> so she arms. thought that was the arm, throw the arms, but she thought that was a part of a putting, a golf swing. <laughs> so anyway, um, so isn't it funny, the, when the power of visualization is, you know, and I worked on that a lot through the, through the 90s, I was a fan of that, um, you know, the pink bubble technique with Shark D, Tika Wayne, where, you know, when you sit and visualize, and send it out to the universe, you know, what you want for the week. Yeah. And you keep doing that. It's unbelievable. It really is. I've heard it mentioned a lot. Wayne Rooney, I think, used to talk about yeah, visualization. You've, got, you've got to see it. I mean, and Jack, you know, Jack called it going to the movies, um, visualizing. You've got to, you got, and as a golfer, you've got to do it. And you can take it up a couple of notches, which is pretty cool. You can, you can either visualize seeing yourself in front of you as a ghost doing it, making the swing. Um, which is quite powerful because I used to be able to stand back and see me in front of it, make the swing I wanted, see the ball fly, but, and then walk up and do it. Yeah. So that's uh, because the mind doesn't know the difference between a rehearsal and the real thing. That's a simple line to know. Yeah. You know, so even you can sit in the. So I first did it. Here's when I first knew it really worked was uh, helicopters. So I, um, 1990, I, my arms were burning. So I thought I needed. I took six weeks off, and I thought I need to do something. I thought, oh. Learn to fly a helicopter. Went down the road, yeah, as you do. <laughs> so I went down and had lessons. It was great fun. And sure enough, shh, off you go. You learn to fly a helicopter. And then the guy said, and I was just about to go away for something, whatever, for other few days, can't remember. It's going to disappear. I had to miss a couple of lessons. He says, oh, next lesson, says, you're going to do your, um, no, in my very first lesson, was just take off. You're going, to take, you're going to pick it up and put it down. You're going to pick it up off the ground. Because most of the time, he, the instructor gets it off the ground with you and yeah. you learn to fly, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was it. So he they said, so next lesson said, you're going to pick it off the ground and put it back down. Yeah. So I, sat, so I sat in a chair. So I just sat in a chair and closed my eyes and I pulled the blue and stick back, whatever, in the power. Then you need to open your eyes. <laughs> yeah, close your eyes. And, and, you, and you sit there and wobble, and you sit there and wobble, because yeah. you pick it up and you feel, right, I've got to find it to stop it wobbling, and, and pick the thing off the ground, and you get it off to six foot off the ground, and you hold it in the hover, and he says, now land it, and you've got to do the, all the opposites. You've got to put it back down, <laughs> without going and crunch. And sure enough, I came back, so I did that like for three days, sitting in the chair a couple of times, 
came back, jumped in the bloody helicopter, and went and picked the bloody thing off the ground, put it in a hover, and put it back down again. Like a, like a piece of cake. Yeah. Like as if I... And he looked at me, and I said, yeah, I've been thinking about it. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. you know, there's a, there's a wacky example of something completely different. So you should try, you should just test yourself. You should, yeah. you should think, keep thinking of doing something really cool like that. And then, uh, well, that's what I'm thinking as I'm hearing you talking, because there are people listening to this podcast who do a variety of they things. They all do it. I mean, do you think you could Messi, apply it? Messi, every time he holds, uh, no, holds kick, <laughs> kicks one of these fabulous bloody free kicks in the top corners, he stands in and sees it. So he goes, uh, yeah, yeah. goes whoosh in a curve over the guy's head up there. And if you keep doing that and you practice it, keep doing it, practice it, keep doing it, you'll get really good at something, I, I promise you. Speaking of which, have you seen that video on Twitter? Someone's put uh, football commentary over golf and golf commentary over football. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. It's Cristiano Ronaldo scoring a free kick. And he goes, Ronaldo now steps up. Ronaldo now. And he sees it. Lovely. It's so good. Soccer clap. <laughs> so they did that moons ago, didn't they? They did. They took um, whispering Sid Lowe, didn't they? So they swapped that with Murray Walker. Yeah. Murray, Murray doing snooker. Don't, and don't, 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 don't. Right hand corner. <laughs> <laughs> so it was quite funny. So I should do that. I should practice I doing. Say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I should practice good. doing other sports. In golf. In golf, there you go. Yeah. I should do it. <laughs> I should think about it. I should do that for CBS. It should be a new yeah. thing. I could, do the, I could do the NFL. Oh, yeah, that'd be perfect. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, Tom Brady takes a couple of steps back and throws it quite nicely into the air. Lo lovely trajectory, and it lands on Dana, who charges, who charges, who gen gently crosses the line and puts it's the ball. It's fantastic. I like it yeah, no, that is, I think it's going to work. All right, next, where are we? Um, I've got a question actually from my dad. Oh. I was telling you off air is is keen golfer. Yeah, and also and called John Daly. Oh yes, and also That's... for the name of a golfer. Now, am I right? Your dad was an accountant. Yeah, my dad was a coach for ICI. Jim, Jim's dad is an He's accountant. Oh, really? <laughs> That's what I asked. Have we got there you go. we got a lot in common. I asked him actually for a couple of questions. So I told him that I was going to interview you, and he's said. So you mentioned Sandy Lyle a lot earlier. Yeah. You guys were rivals in amateur and then professional days. Yeah. Does that rivalry help or a hindrance that, that long state your career? Yeah, well, it's always a help. Guys, it's always good to have guys that you... Um, hey, everybody was a rival. My goodness, as, as we were talking earlier on. I mean, they, that, we had to battle to beat each other and some... Every week. God, you know, and you... When you think how we did it, I mean, it was again, it was like, it was good feelings on the practice ground and go and play. And if it didn't work, it was back to the practice ground. You didn't, you didn't have any way of um, checking things like we do. Everything was feel. Mm. And didn't have, a, you know, we've got great toys now called Trackman and things like this oh. to watch the ball fly and tell you exactly what you're doing. Now, we would like, oh, Caddis, well, it looks like you're doing a bit of this, you're doing a bit of this, Gov. <laughs> and you need a bit of this and a bit of that. And, and you know, it, it's, so, uh, it, yeah, I enjoyed that. I mean, competing. Golf's so tough. I mean, they, they tried to build up a couple of matches, but golf's so tough to get two guys to be really on form that you've selected. You know, you always get a great tournament, but that's two names. You rarely get the two favourites um, at the top of the leaderboard two rivals as well yeah so uh, yeah he beat me a few times I beat him a few times yeah his career's stopped a little quicker than mine yeah does that sort of put you sort of push each other I guess don't you if, if you well either that that era well everybody we had Seve to compete against my goodness so that was the the first shake up because by the time we came on tour at 19 Seve had already won about three national opens and you know Seve was the kingpin so we, you, you gauged yourself very much with him, best you could. But um, he had that ability to make a score, and so he was great for us because he went to America and then he wins the Masters, and that was probably huge to think. Well, okay, I play against this guy every week, and Augusta was not the place where a European player really was going to go and win because it mega fast greens we didn't play on anything as quick as that the odd, only if you ever went to australia but that's only a week or two you know you, you needed to be on that surface quite a few times rather than just bowling up so 
But he made his... Again, that was a mental game, isn't it? If Sebi yeah. can do it, yeah. and I can beat Sebi here and there, we'll get to Augusta and you suddenly view it differently. Find a, find a way. I always thought Sandy Lyle was such a great name as well. Should have been like a detective in Hawaii Five O or something. Sandy Lyle. Sandy Lyle. Great name. <laughs> I was going to say, um, obviously now you're in a different part of your life. Yeah. Do you, do you miss competing? Well, if, yeah, unfortunately, you know, I'm... My day was, you throw out a number, 30 years ago, but then you go, well, that's half my life ago. That's the one that hurts me. Mm. And I think, but, you know, I'm, but I'm all right, Rivet. You know, I've, you know, you have, to, unfortunately, as a, every sportsman, it tails off. You can't keep doing your sport. And golf's a cruel one because it actually, we can keep doing it. Many sports, you're just not quick oh, yeah, enough, yeah, are you? Yeah. You know, you're saying, Bolt, sit, I'm done. He yeah. goes and he's not going to go another and... Yeah. And tennis players are the same if you're just not quick enough. Generally, if you're not quick enough. Yeah. But we have a different kind of sport where you, it, you, it keeps that carrot dangled in front of you that, hey, tomorrow you could shoot a 65. Yeah. And you keep blimming going for it. And mm. it gets harder and harder to do that. And, uh, and you know, and then I was out there for, what, 28, 29 seasons. And then finally it's like, okay, you've had enough. And whether it was in the stars, it might have been because I... I tell you another wacky thing. I was in, I was in Thailand, and you go and visit one of those. Um, we went down at the temples, and you go and visit those uh, grand masters of wisdom or whatever. That, okay. you know, oh, okay. And he's got his, and he, and, so he's never doesn't know who the hell I am, does he? <laughs> Not in a million years. He's so a big old man. Exactly. <laughs> hardly. Didn't go. Oh, I saw you. <laughs> so you give him your just your date and when you're born, and then off they go with their charts, and then he goes, "Oh, you've been doing a profession for twenty nine years and I'm going, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and he yeah. says you're going to change and go into entertainment and I went wow where do you get that one from well, you've been watching you've been yeah. watching you've been watching CBS anyway yeah. so that was kind of a funny thing to then think yeah hey, maybe there is a time to mm -hmm. change and do something different um, you know went to the TV world did a couple of little things but I, I ABC then asked me to go in the tower at Troon in 04 and I went up there for the weekend. I enjoyed it. They enjoyed me. Uh, here we are, crumbs. I think I'm, what am I supposed to start in? Year 16th season, mm -hmm. 14th season for CBS. Yeah, 14th season for CBS next year. We've all got, we've all got two more. They're, they're busy negotiating the whole new, all the contracts are being renewed with the tour, with the PGA Tour. So who knows what happens next? Um, but yeah, I've I've enjoyed it. It's I did say to myself, um, you know, I had a rough time for about five years. And when you change from being a sportsman, you know, successful, and you can't do it, it hurts. Yeah, and it didn't, it's not an overnight thing. It probably took me took me about five years. A bit of a grieving process. Yeah, it, it was a it's it's tough because you just can't do what you love. I'm mean, absolutely loved it obviously and and t television probably helped me because when i got up there i said to myself do i'm not sitting up here wishing i'm out there so that was a good one for starters oh, yeah, so it was a very good and then i started watching and thought oh i could do that and you know you know when th there's a there's all these little things that got to happen you know, kind of outside the office of playing really great golf or maybe that's all it is just out playing great golf mm -hmm. to win um, uh, there's this kind of a sense of timing to it as well with golf, isn't it? You you hit the right shot at the right time, and also anyway. And I thought, oh, that was I could do that. I could go there and fathom out the you know how to make a win happen on a Sunday. And then you then you fortunately you get that word gratitude finally hits you, and then you go, okay, I'm really grateful for what I had. I had that career. I played. I did pretty darn good sure you would always want to think you can do better and what have you but pretty darn good now in a, I'm in a new career I want to be good at this as well that's always that's always me I want to you know quite happy trying to be the best at something and um, I guess you can't quite visualize visualization doesn't quite come into just being in no, the studio it's funny, or it's, in front of the camera. no, no you, you do a little bit because obviously it's live television and you can you know and Jim Nance is He's obviously, all these guys are brilliant. Started off with Mike Chirico and you know, obviously Jim Nance, and I've got Terry Gannon now, and I've had Kelly Tillman and and all sorts, and um, and they are 
the gift of just giving them a picture and yeah. I thought you should think that about Chris Tarrant as well. Oh yeah. Remember Chris? Yeah, you yeah, could yeah. listen to a three hour show of Chris Tarrant, there was never an arm and an arm yeah. or a hesitation and, uh, and I thought, that's brilliant, how can you do that? And I got the same with these guys sitting next to me in ladies as well. They, they rattle away and I think it's brilliant. So it does I'll try to help improve me as well. I'd like to think, try my best to copy them. You still sit and visualize. Yeah, so if, yeah, you, yeah. if I want to be better, well, I've got to visualize. Can I talk as freely and purely as Nance? Probably he could talk for... <laughs> I tease him and I said, he, I said you, you, can, you can talk with, um, without any hesitation, deviation or repetition about yourself, I mean about golf, all day long. <laughs> so, uh, but they, you've got that gift, and, you know, so I'm constantly trying to just be a better uh, analyst. Yeah. I think that's a nice place to end the podcast, but I've got one more question, which I think we were going to ask at the start, but we completely forgot. Oh, bloody hell. Which is... <laughs> I, went an hour, I went an hour talking. Um, what are, you're the first knighted guest we've had on the podcast. Oh, sweet me. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Do you ever get used to it, the sir, the sir Nick? Do I get used to it? Yeah. Uh, I do. Some people yeah. I can sense. Uh, I like it when some people are very comfortable. Uh, you know, just recently I've been listening to people calling me Sir Nick all the time. Yeah. Sir Nick, this, this, and I think, well, that's what it was actually meant to be. Um, we we're asked by the government to uphold that tradition. Yeah. You know, some people think you're a pompous ass. You know. <laughs> I said, well, no, you been given it and then yes you do get it in writing we'd like you to uphold use it correctly upholding yeah. and I try to correct people I think people get the wrong I see in America they call you Cefaldo oh, you know, right. when, you're, when you arrive when you arrive that does sound like a knife it does yes, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. so I said well no, hang on I said so I go so now I could try to say, yeah. if you want to call me it it's it's even lighter it's cynic it's a bit more yeah. fun than Cefaldo oh I get it because most hotels when you arrive sort of thing and of course, in some people in TV, you know, they wouldn't put my, they'd put up Nick Fowler in the night if I ever said, well, actually, it really is uh, Nick now. But, I mean, because some people would have, would have, you know, as you think he is. Yeah. But, you know, with 10 years on now, it, yeah, I was exactly, knighted yeah. 10 years ago across the road. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm quite, quite happy with it. It's yeah. part of the furniture now. Well, yeah. <laughs> Sir Nick Fowler, yeah. Yeah, thanks. thanks for being on the Bank Podcast. Yeah, that's very cool. So there you go, that was Sir Nick Fowdo on the Blank Podcast. Sorry, I was about to take a selfie. I'll do we'll, it we'll take one, we'll take one and put it on Twitter, you can all see it. Okay. Um, what, what a nice guy. Like, uh, there are some people in the sporting world or in the general world, they have a reputation, and then you meet them and you realise, that actually, that's not, it's not true at all. It's a sort of no. media construct. And I know he was saying it was part of, you know, focusing on the game and part of almost a tactic for winning the titles, which worked. Um, but actually, he was a very chatty, friendly guy. Yeah, so. great. And we, we took a picture with the backdrop of the river, and um, he stopped to take some selfies with some fans and stuff. So he was annoyed that your phone didn't have the bright, right brightness on its I screen. Know, I know, I sorted it out after, <laughs> after a few days. You know. But it, I, was, I was trying to conserve battery, though. Well, that's, you have I've to. I've got a long journey that's home. Fair. Yeah, I know you do. But you yeah. do have one of those big battery pack things, and they that's are. No po- that's not the point, yeah. is it? Anyway, <laughs> thank you so much to Sir Nick for uh, yeah. joining us on the podcast. And yeah, it was a really great chat. You know that I love the sporting people on mm, these podcasts, mm. uh, even though I'm not really into golf, and I find it fascinating. All the bits about the visualisation and being in that moment and making time stand still and the little tricks he has to kind of... That thing about forgetting, pretending the last shot was two weeks ago. That's yeah, brilliant. Yeah. I, should, I might apply that to Sunday League the when, when I get, yeah, when yeah, I get the, picked. The visualisation stuff was very, very interesting. We talked some, about some sort of techniques off air as well. The, the purple monkey was one he was talking about. Yeah, um, purple monkey. Yeah, yeah which, was, which sounded interesting. So look, at, look up purple monkey on yeah. Google and see what you come up with. But yes, a psychological 
kind of I really idea hope of sort of changing Double Monkey doesn't how you mean visualize. anything else. <laughs> no, maybe don't look up. Yeah, maybe right. don't. Just <laughs> trust us that it was a good visualization <laughs> technique. Um, but we have some tweets. Hey, of course we do. Okay. Yes, um, I've got one here from. Uh, well, their handle is Music Lover, but it's Tracy J O three seven. Good handle. And, yeah, and she said, uh, "Wonderful episode with Melvin Adoom." On Blagging Podcast with Giles and Jim. Melvin has such a positive energy and brightening my morning. Just do it. Couldn't agree more. Ah, oh, Melvin was great. Yeah. Melvin. Melvin's the sort of person, if you're having a bad day, just think about Melvin or Doom yeah. and you'll have a good day. And one more tick on the Nike uh, branding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Strong Check branding, this. to be fair. Very strong branding. Well, thank you, Tracy. That was a lovely tweet to receive. Um, am I going to do another one, am I? There is another one here, okay. actually, from the Glamorous Vegan. Glamorously Vegan. Oh, my God, yeah, I love yeah. that. It says, uh, listening to the Blank Podcast with uh, you, Charles Billy Phillips. Interviewing, and Jim. Interviewing Caroline Lucas. That, this is one of my favourites, Caroline yeah. Lucas. Really interesting interview. I like how Caroline is very passionate about her views, but is open to listening and learning about the perspectives of others. Definitely. I mean, those are good skills to have in life. I think as a politician, you have to have that. Um, yeah, and it's uh, very, um, obviously very apt at the moment because we're uh, <laughs> head- heading into an election. Oh, yeah, that's going to be interesting. Mm. Caroline Lucas. Ah, the only pod I've got nervous about interviewing. She was like my rock star for me. The people's prime minister. She's just like so the... great. She's just yeah. brilliant. Yeah, she's great. Imagine if she was PM. Everything right. would just be sorted, wouldn't it? The country would good. just be fine. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for those tweets. Yes, They're thank lovely. you as always. It's always lovely to hear from you. So please do, do keep them coming. Yeah. Our handle is... Oh, I get to do it. Yeah. Um, at Blank Pod. And you can find us on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. Uh-huh. All at... At Blank Pod. Yeah. I oh, enjoyed that. And our email address is <laughs> blankpodcast2018 at gmail.com. So if you want to send us an email, that'd be... Oh, we'd we'd love to receive you that. You could become the first person to email. Wait, so we've never had an email? We've never had one single email. I don't think this is indicative of just us. I've, I have heard other people on podcasts saying that they don't receive emails. I think emails people either. prefer social media and tweets Yeah, it's and stuff. quicker, isn't it? It's, it's, I mean, we get, it's nice. We do get nice ones. But if, you, yeah. you know, if you're having a bad day and you want to talk about a blank moment and it's mm. longer than 240 characters... Oh, yeah, please do send, send us an email. We'd we, we happily share your blank moments. With yeah. yeah. It'd be nice to do that. Um, anyway, that's the end of this week's pod. It is. Oh. Yeah, I'm going to go for a walk down the river. Yeah, you fancy joining me? Yeah. Moon River. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. Uh, and we'll see you again soon. Yeah, thank you. What does it mean to be all in? It means you're confident you're doing the right thing. You commit to it. For Dominion Energy, we're all in on helping the environment. We're all in on clean energy, all in on solar, all in on building the nation's largest offshore wind farm. We're even capturing the methane from local farms to create renewable natural gas. We're not doing it because it's the easy thing to do, but because it's the right thing to do. For your family and friends, your neighbors and your community, for the future, for our planet. Dominion Energy. Actions speak louder.